Okay, let's look at some examples of some chapter fours or the results and discussion chapter. So let's start first with this uh, thesis in the Digital Commons by John Budge. Um, in John's particular thesis, which was looking at flipping in a technology-rich classroom, and he was in a middle school, as you can see from the abstract there, a grade 8 classroom. Um, it was a case study that he was doing, and he had one research question that he was trying to answer, and he had two methods of data collection that he was using. So he was using surveys and interviews as his two data collection methods. So let's take a look at his chapter four. So I just clicked on the download link and actually I've scrolled down here through um, to chapter four. So first of all you'll note that it's results and discussion and I'll focus upon the results portion first and then I will note some of the discussion aspects of it. So you can see here his question focuses upon student perceptions of a flipped math classroom. And what you'll note that John has done, and I'll be perfectly honest and say this is probably not the best way of doing this. Um, he's presented it in terms of his quantitative results first and his qualitative results. Um, I'll be honest with you and say that it's much better to present your results in a thematic way and you'll see that in a couple of the other examples but I did want to show this one as an example of something that you could do so as you can see what are student perceptions of a flipped math classroom so looking at his quantitative results which come from his survey you can see he discusses them a little bit here you'll see he uses the you he makes use of figures throughout to essentially highlight some of those responses um, again providing some more information about you know in a narrative fashion or prose fashion as to you know how he makes sense of those particular results and then you'll note as he goes through with each set of results so as an example this here starting on the bottom of page 38 so starting right here with this quantitative results, this here is all a single paragraph. Now there's two um, figures here in this paragraph, which is why it takes almost two pages to do. But it's a single paragraph that be, ends here with, by working harder in school, the need for additional help at home was most likely decreased. So again, trying to make sense of the results. Now you'll note he puts in a paragraph here that discusses those results. So he's presented to you what the data says. Now he's talking about how that data relates to what he found in his literature review. So you'll note he goes back and basically pulls out some information from his literature review that was consistent because you can see he says the results of this study support this previous research. So the things that Kassane and Kemp Hamden et al. and Brett found were consistent with the kinds of things that John found as a part of his study. So, and he follows this kind of model. So again, here starts the next paragraph on the bottom of page 40, the student perceptions of how well they understood the material was a theme in both the quantitative and qualitative results and that's actually a nice way of talking about it so he's getting into this thematic analysis now as opposed to actually just looking at it from a uh, type of data so he provides a figure again and talks a little bit about that moves into another paragraph where he provides um, you know talks about his data and provides a couple of figures about it and then you know that he gets back into the discussion and this kind time it's just just one, this Sams and Bergman 2013. So he talks about what they found and then he basically relates that to his own research. And you note he follows this pattern throughout his entire chapter four. And as you can see, you know, it's a substantial chapter four. I mean, we began back on page 38 there and we're now, um, you know, keeping in mind that there's a number of figures that are associated in here. Um, but you can see that as you're working your way through, and there is a lot of white space because in many cases the figure pushes it on to the next page and probably could have done a little bit of uh, adjusting of the size of the figures to allow for two on a page so you didn't end up with this area of white space here. But even taking into account those area of white spaces, and you can see there um, he moves now into the... Um, the qualitative results and actually in this case he talks about two themes in the qualitative data and discusses each of their talks about each of those themes sorry and then you'll note at the end of each of those sections um, he brings in some of this literature 
as you're moving through. Um, and then there's some unexpected things that he wasn't, you know, expecting to find that he did want folks to know about. Um, but as you can see, you know, here, his complete chapter four takes up basically 15, 16 pages. Now, if you were to remove all of that extra white space, you'd still probably be looking about 10 or 12 pages of content. And that's with a single research question and only two methods of data collection. Now, again, this is probably one of the weaker examples um, that you'll find in the Digital Commons, at least for Chapter 4. And part of that is because of the division of the data by type of data as opposed to uh, thematically. So let's look at another one. Uh, this one here is one by Roseanne Field. And as you can see here, um, she was looking at perceptions on inclusion in elementary schools. Now in her case, she actually has three research questions and she's using uh, interviews, surveys, and observations as her methods of data collection. So when I go to her chapter four, her results and discussion, um, you'll note that she begins by actually providing a little bit of background as to where this actual research took place. So she's giving you a, a little bit of uh, information about the case here. Now, many people will do this in Chapter 3 in the methodology when you're looking at the description of the case or description of the participants or description of the setting. And she did this as well. She had that section in Chapter 3, but as part of her data collection, she actually collected a little bit of data about the participants. So she wanted to actually show that here before she gets into um, the particular one. So her first question looked at teacher perception. So it was actually, what are teacher perceptions of inclusion? And she talks about, you know, there are some significant themes that are here. Um, you know, a definition of what inclusion is, a clear vision that there was a mutual responsibility for both regular education teachers and special education teachers, and that there was, you know, who, uh, the special education teacher who was responsible for the students with an IEP. Um, and then the third theme that she found under teacher perceptions was this, uh, the severe lack of training and experience that directly impacts the teacher. So as you can see here, she starts to develop out these themes and she intertwines her data. Um, so she begins with, you know, some of the interview data that you can see here. Um, she also talks about some of the responses that she got in her survey. And again, this is all using, you know, the multiple pieces of data to develop out this particular theme. Now she moves into the second theme about who's responsible. So she spends a little bit of time here talking about it. Um, as you can see, specifically, she pulls out Inter or, sorry, data from her interview. Um, so you can see she's quoting directly from some of her interviews. And you'll note she's chosen to put it in a table as opposed to making it as part of the narrative. And you will see some examples in the digital commons where they're actually using it as part of the narrative, although not one of the examples I'm going to show you um, today. And, you know, again, using multiple pieces of data for each theme that she's developed. So she includes some of the interview data up here, but then developing out that same theme, she starts using some of the, um, the um, survey data that she's got here. Again, trying to provide you with um, that triangulation to show that the um, theme was actually, you know, present throughout the data. Similarly here, you've got the final theme that she notes, and you'll note in this case, she actually is quoting within the text. So you can see here, Teacher 1 believed, and you can see a quote from Teacher 1. Teacher 2 also explained, and you can see a block quote from Teacher um, 2. And then she moves in and talks about some, again, the survey data. So you can see some of the survey data that she's doing. Um, she also brings in at this stage, you know, some of the observation data that she's got, um, where she's, you know, noticing some of the things that um, is, you know, happening. Again, here's some more data from what appears to be the interview, and you can see it's in a block quote format. Um, you know, and as she starts in this section here, sort of, or this paragraph here, sort of sums up or, um, you know, essentially makes sense of those themes. But it's also where you start to see 
her bringing in the literature. So she's basically making sense of these three themes and then relating what she found to what she was present in her literature review. Um, now you can see and see she's doing the same thing in this paragraph. You know, so she's reminding you the data supported the second theme, yada yada yada, and this finding was supported by these guys who had reached a similar finding. Um, and you know, so she does this kind of model here, and this is really what is expected of you with the discussion. Now I'll be honest and say that um, you know, in this case. Unlike in John's case where he was using multiple pieces of data in his discussion, you'll notice that Roseanne is just using, in most cases, a single piece of literature uh, relating it back to the theme. Although you can see here in this paragraph, she's got a couple of pieces that she's relating back into um, that theme. And that's kind of the model that you want to do. You want to try to find a couple, three pieces of literature that are either consistent or inconsistent with your findings so that you can talk about, you know, here's how what I found relates to what we already knew about this topic in the field. So let's take a look at a third example here now. And as you'll probably note, I'm just moving my way down the list of folks in the digital comments. So at the time this video was put together, John was the first one that was there, Roseanne was the second one that was there, and now Jen is the third one that was here. Uh, so Jen was looking at the impact of early numeracy intervention on kindergarten students. And in her case, she actually had um, two research questions, although the second research question had a part A and a part B. And for her data collection methods, she was actually using student artifacts as well as observations and this uh, validated instrument that she found called the AIMS-10. Um, so if you look at her results and discussion chapter, one of the things that you'll note is that um, you'll see she begins like Roseanne did with a little overview of the, the case again. Uh, so while some of this was included in her chapter three. Rose, um, Jen felt that it was important to provide more detail about it um, using some of the data that she had as well. You'll note you can see some of the literature she's incorporating in here. Um, so up here she, you saw um, you know, Clark and Shin. Um, you're seeing the uh, document here that's looking at RTI in the state of Connecticut. Um, you're seeing Burns 2007. So she's essentially setting you up with situating the case itself within the larger body of literature. Um, now, as you can see when you get into it, her first research question was what is the impact of early numeracy intervention on kindergarten students? And, you know, as you look through, you'll see that um, her first thing is she's looking at this Ames Web 10 data and particularly a pre and post actually a pre mid and post score looking at the level of growth that you're seeing um, throughout this particular document um, and as she continues on in this particular paragraph you'll note she's actually looking at some of the subtests that are included within that document in addition to that document, you'll see that she starts to incorporate now some of the specific data that she has in terms of student artifacts. So you now she's starting to mention some of the specific students. So she starts talking about student C and student D. Um, and when you start looking a little bit deeper into these particular students, you start to get um, you know some of the subsection data that she's looking at here. Um, you know, trying to essentially determine in those particular two students, those were students that um, either were or weren't. They made positive growth, but they weren't as significant as the other three students. So she wanted to look specifically at those um, two students to see um, essentially how that was um, looking. You know, and she starts to talk in here about some of the stuff that she's finding in her observations and student work samples. Um, you can see she's starting to relate that back to the literature. And you'll note, you know, here's three citations here. You see another one here. You'll see another couple down here. Um, you know, again, this is some of the observational data that she has uh, that you know is looking at that particular thing so you can see her observation logs here um, 
you know, still focusing upon those couple of students that you see. Um, you'll note she's back into student D here now, and you know she's actually going through and looking at um, some of her notes on student D. So this is the um, observational data that she's got. She moves now to um, you know some of the student artifacts that you can see here. So as you can see, you know here's some scans of some of the student artifacts, student work samples that she collected. So again, using multiple pieces of data to try to identify the themes within uh, her literature. And now you can see um, she's summarizing, in this case, what she found for this particular research question. And again, trying to bring some of the literature back into uh, this particular one. So, you know, you'll note that this is sort of the kind of model that you often see and um, again keeping in mind that there were a number of figures and a number of tables in this particular one her response to just this first question begins on page 53 and you'll note that by the time she finishes going through the various types of data and trying to make sense of that data and relate it back to several pieces of literature, she's up to page 60. So she's got about six pages, seven pages of data related to, actually eight pages, sorry, of data related to and discussion related to that first research question. And you'll note that that's consistent in terms of that kind of model that she has throughout her um, throughout her chapter. So if you look, her chapter 4 ends on page 67 overall, which meant that there's about 15 to 18 pages of data that she has here. Now keep in mind the first two were describing the research setting a bit, and as you can see most of the last one um, focuses upon summarizing what she found in her chapter summary, but that still means that there was approximately 14 or 15 pages of either presenting the data and the themes that were generated from her three research questions or um, discussing that data in relation to what was already known from the literature in the field. So in both of those instances um, you'll note that, keep it in mind, it's three research questions, about 14, 15 pages. That means that she's spending about five pages or so per research question presenting and discussing the results that she's found, which is probably, you know, about consistent with this kind of work. And I say with this kind of work because you'll note there's a number of tables in here. There's a number of scans of student artifacts that you've gotten here. And she actually includes more that you find in the appendices because in some cases they were actually a little too big to put in here. So you'll note that um, as one example here, you can see that she says go to Appendix C to find some more of these samples because there's just, you know, the scans are too big or the nature of the image just doesn't fit nicely on a page like you see uh, these other ones here. Um, you know, so if you're looking as you're presenting your data, if you are having figures and tables, you know, that four to six, four to seven page range per research question is probably a reasonable amount to be able to describe the themes that you're finding to answer that research question. If you're just providing text-based data, you know, similar to say what Roseanne was doing, where um, in many cases she was just providing you know, or sorry, not Roseanne, what John was providing, where in many cases he was just describing a lot of the data. You know, 61% of the people found this, and, um, you know, the people who were interviewed said this. Um, you probably will be on a little bit less of a range, maybe more in the three to five pages per research question kind of, of model in terms of the depth that you'd be wanting to include in term, in, in, to be able to both present the results of your study and then discuss those results.